Okay, here we go. So for those of you who saw the last time I gave this uh, a talk, which was I don't know, a couple of years ago, so what this is is it's just, it, it's an update on Smart's finances and the the opportunities that may or may not exist. And I always like to start off with tables. For those of you who are over there in the right, you probably can't see this, but this is what the table says. On any given day, there may be an article in the Press Democrat or the Marin IJ, and it might state the cost of SMART is about $420 million. No, the cost of SMART is almost $600 million. And all you have to do, because I'm such a geek, is go through their financial audit reports and pull out the... It's cheating. I know. It is cheating, and you add up all the numbers, and what they don't want to tell the public is there's $60 million of salaries going out to consultants, and another $25 million going out to salaries for uh, 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 members of the SMART staff. There's $25 million of depreciation. And then there's a, almost $2 million on the bond refunding when they were fighting the, fighting the recall. You add up all the numbers across the years, and it's 588 through June of uh, June of 2016, it's easily crossed. It's easily crossed 600 million now. We're almost we're almost done with the fiscal year, and I'll update this table as soon as the financial audit report comes out in this next December. <clears throat> you look at it from a revenue perspective in terms of how much tax money is going into this system over the course of its lifetime until the sales tax expires, and that doesn't just include local sales tax. That includes regional money on two money, state money and federal money, and especially when you throw in the likely $40 million cost that's uh, for the movement of Bikini, you add up all the stuff, we'll have spent over a billion dollars of tax dollars on this system. That is a lot of money, and so the rip part of the question is, what, what's the story? What happened with, with SMART? And the story really is, as I've said, for 10 years, they misled the public. Uh, they were told by consultants before they put the tax measure up, they were told by consultants uh, they needed a half cent sales tax to fund construction and operations of the train, just based on the calculations. They're not that hard to do. And they did a poll, and they didn't have enough to be able to pass a half cent sales tax, so they took the low road. They went for a quarter cent sales tax, and they lied about the finances. And, Nobody believed financial experts and said there isn't enough money to do it, and there wasn't before, there isn't now, and there isn't going to be, as it turns out. And we've been raising le many legitimate questions regarding the finances. Their CFO presents information to the board. I look at some of this stuff, I go, well, how would anyone know what they're doing? They, they don't even segregate out, for example, the difference between the cost of running the trains, which is now going to become particularly relevant, and their capital expenses, but nevertheless, there are huge financial risks that this train system has. I've raised those issues in the press, and well, they don't want to evaluate them because it's very political, and they've been dug down for almost 10 years, and so the current board is continuing the very process that prior boards did, which is not asking questions, not overseeing what staff does, being criticized by two grand juries for not doing their jobs, and ignoring it. Um, one of the things I like to take on as an economist, of course, is because they keep saying it, even though it's not true, and the press repeats it, and who's there to contradict them, which is they said, well, the reason, you know, we can only build that 43 miles instead of the 70 miles we promised the voters was because of the Great Recession. And it, boy, it really reduced sales taxes. And the answer is, yeah, but that's just one hand clapping there because there's another side of the balance sheet. It's called its debt. And interest rates, as you know, have come down. Their debt service costs are a huge proportion of their budgets. The cost of construction, because of the high unemployment, the cost of construction per mile were much less than forecast. So by and large, the Great Recession, there are offsetting effects. And one could get into debates about small numbers here and there. But as a first approximation, the Great Recession is not why. We have only a 43-mile railway. We have a 43-mile rail line because that's all they could ever afford. That's, that's pretty much what the consultants told them in 2005, and it's pretty much true now. So <clears throat> what's true is because of the way train systems work and the economics of how train systems operate, 
Here's the part they never want to evaluate. You know, it costs money to operate a train. <laughs> and as they keep getting outside dollars to extend the rail line further, they're then going to have to operate the trains further. And the question is, how much difference is that going to make? Is it going to pay for the operations? And the answer is no, because it doesn't generate enough riders. And so <clears throat> what is true is even with the shortened line, they still won't be able to consistently provide the services touted by board members and opponents as they will, I'm sure, today when they reveal to the press when the trains are going to start up. Uh, one of the things I did was that relatively careful evaluation. They have to do every five years. They have to do an update to their financial plan, and it's a beauty. <laughs> it's called rosy scenarios. Let's just make it up. Let's see what. Let's see what we can say. And so the plan is for sales tax revenues forecast for constantly rising sales tax revenues uh, that don't account for two recessions, operating expense assumptions that do not increase in real dollars. So all of those people they're paying, their assumption is none of their real wages are going to go up. That's an interesting assumption. Ridership uh, projections contained in the strategic plan are not based on any ridership model that has ever been presented to the public. At one of the uh, recent board meetings where they were setting the fare schedules, Farhad said they had done something like 27 ridership studies. And I sent an email to Gary Phillips saying they've done two, not 25. If they've done another 23, then they haven't posted to the public because they don't want to receive scrutiny for what their assumptions are. Because every time they do post something that does receive public scrutiny, it shows very, very little ridership, as you'll see in a minute when I show you what they, they uh, for to qualify for federal funding for the extension to large, where they had to do a ridership model consistent with federal requirements. And what that showed was a $45 million expense to extend the rail line south of San Rafael would generate 131 riders a day. And that was for 2015. And of course, proponents really pretty much, they just want to deny all these ridership models, which we'll get into in a minute. And their financial plan doesn't account for what is referred to as leverage. So let's do a little sales tax revenues mechanics. Here's 25 years of real taxable sales trends in Marin and Sonoma. This is, this, is, this is real data published by the State Franchise Tax Board. Smart sales tax revenues are approximately uh, a quarter cent times, uh, times taxable sales. And you can see there's been lots of ups and downs in Marin. Is, Marin is smaller, has fewer people buying more things, but fewer people than, than Sonoma County. You can see the, the impact of the Great Recession here. And they like to pretend that, oh, nobody knows what sales tax revenues are going to do. There's, there's no way. So they hire consultants, and consultants do very creepy analyses. It's very embarrassing for me as an economist to see what some of the other economists do in this space. It's not that hard. You can decompose smart sales tax revenue into these four components. Sales tax revenues grow when the population grows. They grow with real income per, per person. And they, inflation matters, what the assumed inflation rate is and the taxable sales per dollar of personal income in terms of how are people spending the income that they do have, how are they portioning it out on taxable goods. And one can decompose this, these two periods between 1988 and 2001 versus 2001 to 2015, and you can just decompose and say, gee whiz, sales tax revenue grew faster before. Well, first of all, there was faster population growth. We're in the middle of the internet revolution, increasing productivity and, and real income. The inflation rate was higher than the Federal Reserve wanted. But then there's this funny little decline on taxable sales per dollar of personal income. What's that about? You'll see in a second. Then you go to the second period, and you go, huh, well, the reason sales taxes didn't grow as fast was population growth didn't grow as fast. Real income, as a lot of people know, 
didn't, per person, didn't grow as fast. The Fed has been pretty much uh, holding to a 2% inflation rate, one should expect it. And look, taxable sales per dollar personal income continue to decline, and you get the numbers and you say, huh, what's going on here? And how do we look at that? And the key piece that's going on are these long-term trends. As household incomes go up, a smaller proportion of their income is spent on taxable goods and services. There's a higher proportion is spent on services. As people get wealthier, they spend a lot more money on services. It's not that the taxable sales don't go up with income, it's as a proportion. And it's true everywhere. It is true. This is evident. this is a graph of every county in uh, the nine county Bay Area. And you can see these long term trends. And what you're witnessing is exactly what you probably know personally. Gee whiz, as your personal income went up, you already had a car, you already had a house, you already had appliances, and so what are you spending your money on? Well, you're spending your money on all kinds of services that may or may not be taxable. And these trends are built in to the structure. Of the city. It has nothing to do with smart. These are built, this is the economic structure of sales tax funding, and that structure has implications for the long-term financial position of this railway industry. So what did they assume? They assumed in their financial plan that sales taxes were going to grow 3% per year. And you say, okay, well, you can't mucky around with inflation. That's really at the responsibility of the Federal Reserve. They've announced a 2% target. They've been pretty good at keeping to a 2% target over a 20 year period. And chances are they're going to continue to. Okay, well, what about the long term trends here in terms of taxable sales? Heck, if income goes up, those things are going to continue to be negative numbers. Maybe they're assuming big population growth. Well, I pulled out, just before I came over here, I pulled out the numbers from the Bay Area Plan. These numbers are 0.7% for, on average, for Marin and Sonoma County. You add up the numbers, you don't get close to 3%. That's a rosy scenario. They have built a financial plan based on a sales tax revenue forecast where they will point to a consultant study, they'll, send, they'll post an appendix to their financial analysis. Nobody on the board will ask any questions. I have sent this information to them. They don't care. I am considered, I am considered an opponent, and they're not really into listening, but that's one of the reasons why they are in serious trouble. Let's look at that from another perspective. They would put this graph up here, not looking at this past stuff, because that's really basic before Smart really uh, passed the sales tax, but it's a quarter cent times prior tax to sales. And you'd say, well, it looks like they're really on target. This is their strategic plan. Gee, Mike, what's wrong with that? And the answer is they're not accounting for this. Recessions. There's at least, based on historical averages, two recessions in their planning horizon between now and 2029. Absolutely. I, they'll be lucky if, they, if we only have one recession. And no kidding, sales tax revenues go down in recessions. But look, they take a long time to recover because recessions generate a lot of unemployment. People's incomes go down, and they buy less. No kidding. <laughs> Did they take account of any of this? No, I've written op-eds on this. I've, has any board member ever said, gee, Aaron McGrath is their CFO, how are you accounting for recessions in your strategic plan? And the answer is, they are not. And in particular, they're claiming they have sufficient reserves. Oh, we've got, we believe we have sufficient reserves. They have done no analysis that I've ever seen to suggest they do have sufficient reserves. They do have reserves. Are they sufficient? I kind of doubt it because two things happen in a recession to a transit agency. Their sales tax revenues go down and their fair revenues go down because fewer people ride the train because they're unemployed. Okay, so we can, we can do some analysis. We can accumulate, gee, what happened in, life, in prior recessions regarding what the loss of sales tax revenues potentially is. And you can see 
that dependent, it's entirely dependent on how deep a recession is. And I'm not about to forecast a deep recession or a moderate recession, but it is something a responsible agency that is collecting over $30 million in local taxes would appreciate if they actually considered it. And the answer is they have. So what did their financial plan actually say about recession? You had to date to find the following set. The adopted financial plan says, and this is related to if there's a recession, a more likely scenario, however, would be for the agency to address revenue shortfalls by reducing operating costs or increasing fairness. <laughs> Which is exactly what I've been writing about for 10 years. Reducing operating costs in a rail agency means, cut, means cutting rail service which reduces rail ridership and breaks even more promises and increasing fares will reduce ridership further as I don't think the public really understands exactly how high those fares really are. But they're, they're going to find out. And then on top of that, there's no accounting for the word leverage. Everyone here know what leverage means? Remember the mortgage meltdown? That was about a bunch of people borrowing a bunch of money for housing they couldn't afford. And when the value of the house went down, they that they ended, up, they ended up leaving the house. Smart committed to what's called a back-ended bond Ooh. in 2012. Ooh. These are the debt service commitments they've made, and debt service is a senior commitment to operating and funding trains. That means, I've been asked, will they have enough sales taxes on the bondholders? That's all they care about. It's enough sales taxes to pay off the bonds, and the answer is absolutely. You have to get into a pretty wild scenario to believe that they, they can't pay off the bond. But having enough left over to subsidize operations, that is a totally different story. And you just have to do the calculation and say, gee whiz, what proportion of the sales taxes are we paying just to pay off the bond? And you'll see over time, these are numbers from their plan. They have a rising ratio. That means leverage. They are, under their plan, they're increasing the leverage. They're, the proportion of the revenue stream going to just pay off the bond is increasing because these, uh, these uh, the debt service payments are going. And, you know, a couple of times, boy, between uh, fiscal year 2015 and 2016, it went up five, almost $5 million. Not a question from a board member regarding what, what the implications are. But today, they have a new budget in front of them. So I pulled this information off. They had actual sales tax revenues of 36 million uh, that's ending in this fiscal year 2017. They're expecting 37 million. That's an increase of, uh, that's an increase of 700,000. And their debt service is going up by 400,000. What does that mean? It means the debt service is absorbing increases in sales tax revenues. Which means, what? They've got rising operating expenses falling underneath them because it takes money to operate trains. And where is that going to come from? And the answer is, they're going to have to cut operations. And they haven't even started yet, but we'll find out. So <clears throat> the smart has plenty of funds to pay, off the, uh, to pay off the bonds. But leverage means the following. When sales taxes go down, Leverage means the impact on the operating revenues is almost twice as much. So a 10% decline in sales tax revenues is a 20% decline in terms of the revenues available to subsidize operations. And what does it mean? SMART's going to have to cut deeply in operations in the next recession. They have yet to disclose what cuts are likely, but it's going to be pretty clear. They can they got a train starting up in the morning a little after 4 o'clock in the morning. You know, they don't operate for free. At some point, it will occur to them <laughs> that, in fact, it doesn't make a whole lot of economic and financial sense to be operating trains that are near empty. Question? Uh, yeah. How conservative, or were they conservative in, in determining what the potential ridership would be? Well, it, repeat the question. The, 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 thank you. Ridership. The, the question is, how conservative were they in terms of potential ridership? And the answer, the first question, answer is, how would you know? Because they, they haven't presented anything. But when they have presented the required public scrutiny, 
that's, for example, in 2008, where they had the number in the EIR that showed while they were trying to promote this was going to do something about traffic between Sonoma and Marin, that the train would only take 232 people from Sonoma County and from Marin County. That is a theoretically conservative number, but that number was for 2025. We're a long, we're a long way from 2025. Excuse me, we're going to have a question uh, and answer period okay. following us. Okay. So if you could hold your questions. Okay. So ridership in a recession, okay, will decline from a triple whammy. Number one, recessions reduce jobs. No question about it, commuters and peak hour trips that are going to be hit, hammered in a recession. Reduce rail service le levels because they're going to have to cut operations will make riding trains even more inconvenient. And higher fares that they're going to have to raise fares to somehow cover their budget deficits are going to make the trains riding more expensive, all of which leads to even lower ridership. And I assure you, they're not going to have a whole heck of a lot. So <clears throat> all, all of the research, and there's tons of research. There is the co-chair of the campaign in 2006, Joy Dalton. She has a PhD in transportation studies that she got over at the Institute of Transportation Studies at UC Berkeley. Gee whiz, it would be nice if those guys came over here and explained transportation economics to the public, but they didn't want to get involved. All of the studies indicate the following. The vast majority of riders who are going to ride this train are going to want to drive their cars to a train station and park. SMART has constructed less than 300 parking, parking spots. Four stations have no parking spots, and uh, of the 300 parking spots, 100 of them are at Hamilton. So you ask yourself the question, where are people going to park? And the answer is, they're assuming people are going to ride their bike or take buses to the smart stations. <laughs> they're making claims about bus connectivity, which are crazy. Then there's the question about what are people going to do when they get to the destination station, how are they going to get to their jobs? And if their job is at walking distance from the station, it might be a convenient trip. It's just that we, we don't have a lot of jobs near stations that people can walk to. And it's one of the reasons why the formal ridership models continue to have very, very, very low ridership. And it is the primary reason. It was the primary reason. It is the primary reason. And it will be the primary reason that smart ridership is going to be extraordinarily disappointing. This whole free fare period that they may be initiating for some period of time. People think it's great marketing. Well, it's great marketing when you have a network of transit systems operating and they're providing convenient trips. What people in Marin and Sonoma are gonna find out is the reality, which is the trains don't operate very conveniently. They don't have any place to park and there's no way for them to get from the destination station to their job. And for sure, a lot of these commuters are not gonna switch the buses that probably aren't going to serve that many stations in the, in the first place. This is the, a diagram, which I will explain just very briefly. This is a diagram of what they had posted on their website until a few weeks ago, which was they were promising seven morning trains, one midday train, seven afternoon trains. And what you see in this diagram is one is just plotting each train. They had seven trains going. And this is what they had sold the public on until the prior, the prior board meeting regarding what was going to happen. They ha and they were going to be using seven trains. It turns out they're not going to be using seven trains. And one of the reasons is Farha did not tell the board that because they weren't paying engineers enough, they couldn't recruit enough engineers to operate all the train sets. And so their schedule is constrained by using only four train sets. And this is their revised schedule. And I'd just like to point out a couple of things in terms of the, they were promising 30 minute headways right in the middle of the morning commute. They're not 30 minute headways. This is a 90 minute headway. The two yellow ones are 60 minute headways. Uh, this, is, uh, this is the southbound, but the one I really like to show is this one. You miss the train, you work in San Rafael, and you come in from Sonoma County, you miss the 5.30 train going north. You're gonna wait an hour and a half for the next train to take you north. That's the current adopted schedule before the smart board as, as we speak. These are, these are things the public is only going to find out about. 
They're not going to read in the paper. First of all, that not that many people read local newspapers. The reporters, despite my better efforts, get them to say all these things, and the stories don't. They just they usually just repeat whatever the smart board, uh, the smart folks want them to repeat. But it's crazy. The public is going to find out that these trains are very inconvenient. There are no parking spaces. And as a matter of fact, there's no way to get to the train stations to where they want to go. And there was this question about ridership models. One of the things the proponents love to do is to deny how ridership models work, whether they're any good. And gee whiz, no one knows. Farhad was saying at a smart board meeting a, few, a couple months ago, they had done 25 studies. And so he just pulled the numbers straight out of the, straight out of the air. The reality is, if they've done them, they've kept them to themselves. But here are the two numbers that we can actually know. The EIR, which was done by Parsons Brinkerhoff, showed 230 Sonoma County residents would take seven morning trains to Maroon. They had to use a consultant to do their federal environmental assessment for the Larkspur extension. They, not me, they are the ones that said there would be only 131 riders on 15 trains uh, during the day. Now, it, it turns out to be less than 10, 10 people per train. Yet the FTA was, was willing to fund it. And this, is, this is their appendix, which is proof of that, that situation. The final deal, which is really probably going to lead to the failure of the sales tax that you read about in today's newspaper, is what is happening in downtown San Francisco. It is a crime. Smart Tracks bisected Bikini Bus Transit Facility in downtown San Rafael. That's the fact. And I got to say, Amia Culpe here, I did not realize what the implications of that were. And if our lawyers in 2006 had understood the implications, I assure you there would have been a sequel lawsuit. According to Golden Gate Transit, about 9,000 people a day use the bus transit center. That's people getting on and off buses based on various counts and estimates. Smart proponents sold the public the importance of getting smart to Larkspur in order to connect to the Larkspur Golden Gate Ferry. Oh, this is very important. In the process of uh, proceeding forward with this plan, Smart needed someone else to fund it. No surprise there. It was the collapse of the Green Bay project that provided the opportunity in the middle of the night that Pam could shift the funds from the Green Bay project that was very unpopular and allocate $20 million for Smart. And that's when they went to the FTA to make up the difference, which is now before the FTA. But here's the headline. Smart hasn't gotten the money yet. And they may not get the money. There's a lot of stuff going on in Washington, D.C. regarding capital projects. And this one is not in the favor of the Republican Party. So plans progressed. Applications were made. Everybody in the process ducked. Absolutely ducked. That's the entire transportation planning infrastructure of Marin County, Golden Gate Transit. Forgot about, didn't want to raise for political reasons the impact or minimize the impact in, in the environmental analyses on bus transit users, pedestrians, automobile drivers in San Rafael on Highway 101 in Central Marin during the peak hours, and the cost and the disruptive impact of moving Bikini which is now estimated to be around $40 million. Smart's goal of paying federal funding so the rail could be extended south of downtown San Rafael, despite the fact that the ridership models show they aren't going to get a lot of riders. And the status is it's been included, $22.5 million was included in the federal budget, but the money has not yet been paid. And what can we learn from this? Our local political leaders and transportation staff failed us, absolutely failed us. Multiple agencies, TAM, Golden Gate Transit. I assure you, the transportation planners in TAM, and the MTC, they know what SMART is. They know what the numbers are. They just, for political reasons, went along with the show. And for what? Why did they do this? They are about to screw San Rafael. There's Kate Collin is over there. She is very worried about it, as she is ought to be worried about. They know traffic is coming because there are 50,000 cars a day based on their engineering counts using two major arteries, second and third avenue, crossing the train tracks. And when those act grade crossings come down, I assure you there's going to be traffic impact. Smart's own model indicated only 131 people would take the trains. Where, where was everybody? By the time they finally got attention, it was too late. I talked to Golden Gate Transit board members. Oh, no, no, this, is, this was always part of the plan. Oh, yeah, that's a really complicated area. 
<laughs> I watched a, I watched a, a uh, Marin County Transit board meeting uh, in September 2016, and one of the members of the board of all leave on me actually said, well, I certainly hope this won't impact bus transit users. <laughs> At that moment, they were talking about parking buses on the city streets of San Rafael because they had no they had nowhere to put them. It is it is a it is a real it is a real shame. And the reality is that come the time for the refunding of the sales tax, I imagine there's going to be a coalition of people, some who are anti-tax, some who really believe that the we need to absolutely reform the transportation transportation planning sector of Marine County. They have done us a huge disservice in the middle of a congested area. They are going to create more congestion. Being claiming they concerned about global warming, the congestion is going to release more gases into the atmosphere than anything that SMART could take because they're not going to take enough riders. So we are creating a huge problem for thousands of people every workday, right in the middle of the peak hour, right in the middle of a congested area for 131 riders a day because politicians lied to the public 10 years ago. I think they're optimistic. <laughs>